Good morning, church, and Happy New Year. My name is Pastor Sarah Isbell, and I'm so pleased to welcome you this morning to Bloomington Wesley United Methodist Church on this, the first Sunday of the new year, the Sunday that we often call Epiphany Sunday. I'm especially delighted to welcome to the pulpit today our guest speaker, Reverend Vaughn Hoffman. Vaughn is the well-known and much beloved former pastor of this congregation, my predecessor, and has kindly agreed to be with us in worship today, to bring us the good word, to bless us with some very special music, and to lead us in John Wesley's covenant renewal prayer. John Wesley, who was the founder of the Methodist movement and the namesake of this congregation, wrote this prayer and designed this service as an opportunity for churches and Christians to renew themselves in their faithful walk with God at the beginning of a new year. His brother, Charles, hymn writer extraordinaire, wrote a particular hymn especially for this day entitled, Come, Let Us Use the Grace Divine. I invite you as we sing this hymn in just a moment to be particularly aware of how the hymn calls us to renew our faith and renew our covenant with God. Our hymn will be led this morning by Ellen Hagen on piano and Ron Keysweater on vocals. We are excited to welcome Mr. Craig Dietz, our brand new organist, next Sunday when he will begin his service here at Wesley United Methodist Church. But in the meantime, welcome Ron and welcome Ellen and welcome Vaughn and welcome all of you to this special worship service. I hope you had a great Christmas and I hope you had a great New Year's. You might be wondering why I'm still wearing my Christmas clothes, but the Christmas story isn't over. It goes on into what's called Epiphany. And I have an idea, which is kind of an ep Epiphany. Mr. Gary, do you think Smidge and Smudge could be in the box room at church? Let's go look. We keep boxes in this room. They could be in here. Mr. Gary's going to continue our story today. Epiphany season. 
Smidge and Smudge decided it was time to search for a permanent place for their nest. They agreed one of the empty boxes would be perfect. Both mice made many trips in and out of the box with bits of ribbon, yarn, and cotton balls from Sunday school rooms and straw from the nativity scene. Smidge added a tiny foil star as the final touch. Smidge and Smudge both stood back to admire their new home before crawling inside. Without warning, the box began to shake and then to move. The mice escaped just in time. Somebody picked up their new home along with other empty boxes and carried them away. Oh no, shrieked Smidge. What's going on? asked Smudge. You didn't think Christmas would last forever, did you? asked the voice. The two young mice jumped and giggled. They were used to the voice speaking to them when they least expected it. We like Christmas, the two mice said together. Ah, yes indeed, the voice replied. Just as winter follows fall, another new season follows Christmas. The next season is Epiphany, the voice continued. See, the people are packing away most of their Christmas decorations. It is such a busy time. Indeed, indeed. With that, he was gone. When all was quiet, Smidge and Smudge crept into the church. Although most of the Christmas decorations were gone, Smidge discovered that some of the nativity scene remained. The shepherds had been replaced by men in royal clothing who were carrying gifts for Jesus. The voice explained that these men were magi, or wise men, who came from far away to celebrate Jesus' birth. Smidge listened as the pastor talked to the children on Sunday. The pastor said, Epiphany reminds us that Jesus is the light of the world. He pointed to a star on the Epiphany banner. I could not find Smidge and Smudge in the box room, but I'll keep looking. Will you pray with me? Thank you, God, for this Christmas season. Thank you for this new year and thank you as we move into the season called epiphany we're so grateful that you're with us no matter what the season is we love you in jesus name we pray amen bye guys good morning what a joy to be with you today it is uh, it feels wonderful to be back in this beautiful sanctuary how long it's been since i've been here and i in my mind's eye as i look out on the pews uh, that now by of necessity are, are, are empty, I think of all of your faces and the places where I would look for you normally uh, as a congregation. It's a joy to be here. I'm grateful to Sarah for her warm welcome and invitation to come back and share in a service with you today on this first Sunday of the new year. You know, I have always felt the new year, even though it is in many ways a secular holiday, it has so many religious dimensions to it. This whole idea of new starts and looking f into the future and, and uh, valuing our time, recognizing the time is going by, all of those things have natural religious dimension to them. And it's a privilege to, to share in this service today uh, with, the, uh, with the Wesley uh, Covenant service, uh, such a long and important history it has in our denomination and church life and in our faith. Uh, I want to begin by inviting you to join with me in the opening prayer this morning. Let's join together as we pray. O oh God, searcher of all our hearts, you have formed us as a people and claimed us as your own. As we come to acknowledge your sovereignty and grace and to enter anew into covenant with you, reveal any reluctance or falsehood within us. Let your spirit impress your truth on our inmost being and receive us in mercy for the sake of our mediator, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. I invite you now, as we come to this time of covenant and worship, uh, to begin with a litany of thanksgiving. Uh, you'll find your part as it comes up on the screen, uh, but I would invite you to join with me in a spirit of both worship and prayer as we offer this litany of thanksgiving. Let us give thanks for all of God's mercies, 
O God, our covenant friend, you have been gracious to us through all the years of our lives, and we thank you for your loving care, which has filled our days and brought us to this time and place. We praise your holy name, O God. You have given us life and reason and set us in a world filled with your glory. You have comforted us with family and friends and ministered to us through the hands of our sisters and brothers. We praise your holy name, O God. You have filled our hearts with a hunger after you and have given us your peace. You have redeemed us and called us to a high calling in Christ Jesus. You have given us a place in the fellowship of your spirit and the witness of your church. We praise your holy name, O God. You have been our light in darkness, a rock of strength in adversity and temptation. You have been the very spirit of joy in our joys and the all-sufficient reward in all our labors. We praise your name, O God. You remembered us when we forgot you. You followed us even when we tried to flee from you. You met us with forgiveness when we returned to you. For all your patience and overflowing grace, we praise your holy name, O God. Friends, I'd invite you now into a time of prayer together, beginning with the prayer for a new heart. It can be found on page 392 of the United Methodist Hymnal. I invite you to bow with me. O thou who art over us, Thou who art one of us, thou who art, give us pure hearts that we may see thee, humble hearts that we may hear thee, hearts of love that we may serve thee, and hearts of faith that we may abide in thee. O gracious Lord, on this first Sunday of the new year, we do ask for a new heart. We do seek a new start. God, the year behind us has been difficult. We have struggled and suffered to make sense of this pandemic. We have sometimes failed to be obedient servants. We have disregarded and disrespected one another. Oh God, we have, we have failed. We ask that you would watch over us and bring us to new life and new hope in this year to come particularly for those who have most suffered the effects of COVID-19, we ask your grace and mercy. For those who have suffered in body, mind, spirit, or relationships, we ask your healing. For our community, for businesses, first responders, teachers, business owners, and essential workers, we ask for your strength and your courage to make it through what is not yet an easy time. O oh God, for our students, our children, seeking to learn and to grow even in the midst of such difficulty, we ask your grace. Help them, O oh Lord, to be not just renewed, but to be inspired, to become the people that you have called them and called us all to be. For our nation, O oh God, still divided, still troubled, still sorting out what it is to be these United States, we would ask that you'd pour out your mercy, that you would call us to repentance and help us, O oh God, to live in mutual respect and regard. As we step into this new year, we would ask and plead, O God, that you would step with us, that you would carry us across the threshold into 2021 and help us to be new people. Help us to be renewed in covenant, in mind and body and spirit and relationships. Help us, O God, to be made new. May the covenant prayer that we will pray later on in this service be prayed sincerely and honestly from the depths of our heart as we seek to be new people, new people for you. All this we ask, God, gratefully and humbly, in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught his followers to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
and lead us, not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We've been talking this morning about preparing to renew our covenant, our relationship with God. God began this intimate relationship with humankind long before we were born. As early as the book of Genesis, we see God reaching out to humankind, offering a unique relationship of trust and self-giving. Old Testament covenants were often sealed by a sacrifice, by human beings bringing a sheep or a ram to the altar of God to show they really meant what they said, to offer up a life as a sign of commitment. Well, the covenant was made new in Christ Jesus, who showed us what self-giving was really all about. He offered up his own life, taking the place of all other sacrifices to show God's commitment to us. And so now we are invited in this time of worship to respond in love, to show we really mean what we say, and to offer up our own lives as a sign of commitment. When the Church of Jesus Christ invites your financial offerings, we're inviting you to do more than just pay for the services and utilities that the church provides. We're inviting you to say yes to God's invitation to be a part of this special relationship to respond to the gift that God gives you in Jesus Christ. Now maybe giving to the church through a tithe or percentage of your weekly income, through support of particular ministries, maybe that's something that you regularly do. You don't even have to think about it. Or maybe this is the first time you've really considered participating in the offering financially, and you're wondering how to do that. Well, Wesley Church makes it easy to give. You can send a check through the mail to 502 East Front Street, Bloomington, Illinois, 61701. You can give through our website, www.wesley-umc.com slash give, or you can text to give. Right now, even while you're watching this video, you can text offering to 309-822-4442 and follow the prompt to our secure Vanco site. However you respond to the invitation today, we invite you to consider it an act of gratitude, a thank you for all that God has already done for you. Maybe something about saying thanks will feel good and right to you. Maybe it will become a new spiritual practice in the coming year. Friends, let's pray together. O oh God, you who first gave yourself to us, may the covenant relationship into which you invite us this day be sealed and confirmed by our giving back to you. Through our prayers, presence, gifts, service, and witness, may we show our gratitude and our intention to live more fully and faithfully for you in the coming year. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Listen now to the scripture reading today from Paul's letter to the Philippians. Uh, the context of the letter is, is worth talking about a minute before I read the short verse. You know, Paul was in prison when he wrote this letter to the church at Philippi. He was imprisoned in Rome, and uh, it was not the first time he had been in prison. And it's, it's quite likely that when he penned this letter, he not only would have been in a cell, but probably close confinement as a repeat offender, basically. Uh, the Romans were not kind to prisoners uh, in, in the best of circumstances. And it's quite likely Paul could have even found himself in a solitary confinement or chained to a wall, if you can imagine this. Uh, and the context for him writing to the Philippians is they have sent him a care package of some kind. We don't know what was in the package. I like to think it was like one of those cakes with a hacksaw baked in it or something like that, where he could have made a break for it, like those old prison movies. I, but I don't think so. I don't know what they, they sent in the care package. But the section I'm going to read to you from the fourth chapter is his response uh, to them. And, uh, you know, you can tell from the way he writes, thank you notes can be tricky, and he's having a little trouble with, with thanking them. Here's what he says, uh, Philippians 4, the 10th verse. I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last you have revived your concern for me. Whoops, he said, oh, in, indeed, you were concerned for me, but had no opportunity to show it. 
You can tell it sounded like a little skull. He's trying to fix that. You were concerned, but you had no, no opportunity to show it. Not, not that I am referring to being in need, for I have learned to be content with whatever I have. I know what it is to have little, and I know what it is to have plenty. In any and all circumstances, I have learned the secret of being well fed and of going hungry, of having plenty and of being in need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. In any case, it was kind of you to share my distress. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of God shall stand forever. Let us pray. Grant, O Lord, that we might be the masters of ourselves to become the servants of others. Take our minds and think through them. Take our lips and speak through them. Take our hearts and set them on fire for thee. Amen. Years ago now, when we lived up in the little town of Mantino, north of Kankakee, there was a horrible train wreck that happened very near our house one day. You may remember the story. It was in the 90s, the Amtrak train, city of New Orleans, left Chicago one weekday morning, like it always did, on its route south. It was full of passengers, and just a few miles outside of our little town of Mantino, as it was picking up speed, now leaving the city and heading across the cornfields of Illinois, it collided at high speed with a loaded semi-truck. The truck was carrying rebar, concrete reinforcing steel rod, and it was full of rebar, and the city of New Orleans smashed into it at the intersection. It was a horrible collision. It derailed the train, which the, the fuel tanks of the, uh, of the engines were full of diesel fuel. It had just left Chicago, all prepared to go all day down to New Orleans, full of diesel fuel. And those rebar rods, when it hit that truck, ripped open the fuel tanks as it derailed, sloshing diesel fuel all over the cars that followed as they scraped down the metal tracks. And with the sparks flying from rock and metal scraping on metal, what you would expect to happen did happen. It caught fire. It was a horrible, horrible accident. It was a huge calamity. 11 people died. 120 people were hurt that day. Uh, a, a, an awful day in the community. Uh, the, the first paramedic on the job at that crash site was a young woman from our community named Connie, who I knew pretty well. She was not a member of our church, but I knew her because I had officiated at her wedding some year or so prior to this. And at the time, Connie pulled up in the ambulance as the uh, paramedic uh, on duty that morning. She was uh, five months pregnant with her first child. And she arrived on that scene with a driver, an, an EMT in the ambulance, and the passenger train engulfed in fire. And what she did was truly heroic. I know we use the word hero a lot, for, probably overuse it uh, in many ways, but what she did was absolutely the actions of a hero. She repeatedly went into these burning rail cars, one after another, and started to drag people out, the injured, some of them in shock, some already dead. Uh, she went in over and over again in this burning train as the fire people arrived and started to put the thing out. She didn't wait. She went in while it was still burning and, and, and literally saved dozens and dozens of people. Some months after it was over, I saw Connie on the street and I came up to her and said how proud you know, we were of her and what a hero she was for the town. And, and, and we talked a little bit about that whole experience as she had gone through it. And at one point I asked her, how in the world did you steal yourself to do that, to go into that dangerous situation? And, and I don't know that I could have done that. How, how'd you find the courage to do it? And she said, you know, I've thought about that a lot and it's kind of interesting. 
I didn't really find myself hesitant at all when we pulled up. I kind of marvel at it now in retrospect, but I wasn't really hesitant. And it's not like I felt any kind of bravado or anything like that. Uh, it, it was just like, of course I'm going in. That decision to go in wasn't even debatable because in a sense, it was made years before I even got there. It was made when I decided to become a paramedic. I guess that's when I decided to go in. So when I said yes to who I was, it defined what I would do. And I thought, yeah, that's powerful stuff. When you think about how often it is in our life that prior commitments, when we take them seriously, really do shape our actions in ways we might never imagine down the road. And, and um, I think about that for all of us, there are certain commitments we're called upon to, to do that for us, to kind of shape our identity so that we, when you know who you are, you have a clear sense of what you'll do uh, later on down the way. Confirmation vows are supposed to be that, when we, that we take on, most of us as teenagers. Uh, wedding vows, some of us make, a, a prior commitment to love, honor, and cherish, for better, for worse, richer, for poor, sickness, and health. Partly to make that prior commitment is we don't wake up every morning and say, gee, am I going to be respectful and kind and compassionate to my spouse? The, the, the idea of a wedding is this commitment is going to shape you. You don't have to ask that question because you already know the answer. Um, prior commitments. Uh, I think that's what Wesley had in mind with this service that we're gonna to do today. Uh, commit yourself to God ahead of time at the beginning of the year because that will shape how you act. Uh, even when you find the, the train wreck in front of you later on down the, down the months and no doubt something will happen that will make it difficult to be faithful. But Wesley was convinced that if you start the year off asking yourself important life questions right at the cusp of the year. Later on, later on, when the chips are down, you've already decided who you're gonna be, or at least as much as possible, you've prepared yourself. I've prepared myself to take the faithful course. I think that makes a lot of sense. And uh, as we come to do that this morning, I, I thought it would be well just to think a little bit about specifically what Wesley had in mind or, or uh, to commit ourselves to God in that way. What kinds of questions do we ask ourselves in preparation for a covenant renewal service? I, I think the questions are, are, are questions like these. To what am I going to devote my life's attention in the very short time span I have in this world? What's going to captivate me? And what's going to be the focus of my life's energy, the things I'm going to care most about. All of those things, you know, if you boil that down, it's, it's a question really about what am I going to worship? What are you going to worship in the next 12 months? Uh, you know, the truth is that everybody worships something, whether we're overtly wor uh, uh, religious or not. That was the, the thinking of uh, the theologian named Paul Tillich, a tw great 20th century theologian. Tillich said, everybody is religious, whether they know it or not. Everybody's religious in the sense that everybody has what he called an ultimate concern. And, and, and that is something that we put at the center of our lives, even the most irreligious person, you know, has, a, has a, a God in the sense it might just be their own whims, their material goods, the, you know, the esteem of the, their appearance. All kinds of things can be a God for us. Tillich said, everybody's got a God. Everybody's religious in the sense that we have an ultimate concern. And that which we put at the center of our life will shape us for good or ill, uh, even when we aren't consciously thinking about it. Uh, so for my own edification, I thought, you know, what, what are the things that I want to put at the center of my life? Well, I, I thought I, I'd just kind of confessionally share some of them with you. Not that your list would be the same as mine, but I thought maybe uh, you might want to think about how you would answer those very questions. What's, what's at the center? What are the things that you currently value? And what might you want to value more as the next year unfolds? Um, what do I want to put at the forefront of 2021? 
Uh, as I thought about that, the first thing that came to me, uh, the obvious one, is uh, to deepen my faith. Like most of us, I would say that I care deeply about my faith already, but the, the honest truth is that oftentimes, I think many of us, certainly I can confess, I get on autopilot in my faith. I'm not as awake or as interested as I want to be or as appreciative as I ought to be of the deep mysteries of life and of who God is and what God is doing and how Jesus' teachings and his life shape me or could shape me more deeply. I, I'm not as awake as I could be to the spiritual wonders of faith and, and caring for my uh, spiritual well-being as, as deeply and as, as fully as I could. And that's not just about the typical spiritual disciplines of prayer and Bible reading and worship, though it does involve those things. There are other things that uh, I know shape my spirit and, and make me a, a deeper person that uh, I, I need to attend to more. I think of somebody like Charles Darwin. You know, the story of Charles Darwin, the famous scientist is, he uh, in, uh, read poetry every day and he played music every day. He said, because he wanted to be connected to a world that was deeper than just the things he could observe and touch and see. I, and I do too, I do too. So, so I wanna be more conscious about what I read and the music I listen to and what connects me to God, I'm convinced will always be time well spent. And it's the road to experiencing the days I have left more fully and more deeply. So that's one thing. Uh, be careful about my faith and more attentive to it in the deepest sense of the word. What are the things that will make me a deeper person? Another thing that I wanna be sure that I get put back in the center of my life uh, always is uh, my relationships. I need the constant reminder, maybe you do too, to savor every moment in my relationship with my wife and my family and my friends. And uh, I've lived long enough to know how easy it is to take the people I love for granted. And all of us, I think, have experienced firsthand how time sometimes gets away from us. And those opportunities to let others who are important to us know how important they are, those things can slip away. Uh, especially now, you know, in the pandemic, uh, we had empty spaces around our dinner table at Christmas time. And it reminds me that I can't count on next year to be the time when I talk about how much I love those around me. The time to do that is always now. I think it was Martin Buber, the great Jewish theologian who said, uh, our, the, the object of living well is to hallow every day. That, that a life well lived is basically the sum total of individual days well lived. And certainly that's true of your relationships. You know, to put off till some future day the opportunity to share and, and convey your love to those that matter to you, that's uh, not the way to go. Uh, to be recentered in the value of relationships, certainly something that is important to me. Also, on my recentering list this year is um, uh, my relationship with the natural world and my commitment to the well-being of the natural world. Uh, some of my deepest moments of spirit and awareness of God's presence happen outside. I don't know if that's true for you or not, but when I get outside, uh, and even you know, just seeing life abounding in the city park, a squirrel and the, the blue jay and just simple things, taking time to recognize my kinship with uh, the, the world around me. That is both humbling and it is uplifting. It reminds me of the interconnectedness of life and my place in it. And so to be cognizant of both my being a part of the natural world and my call to care for its well-being, I think is a part of what I wanna put in the center of my life as I recommit my covenant to the one who created uh, this natural world uh, and who set me and you both in it. Another thing I wanna commit myself to in the covenant today is the value of courage. Uh, this year, I wanna be more courageous in speaking out on injustice uh, and, and worry less that people might not like me if I'm forthright on issues that are important to me. Uh, 
however uh, much or little time I have left, I want to be remembered for being one of those people who is courageous enough to stand up for those who are in need and not worry about uh, you know being liked for who I am not. I would want to be liked uh, for a person who stood up for the things God cares about. Doing justice, loving kindness, walking humbly with God. Uh, so that's something I want to get back in the center of my life, the courage to speak up for justice. And then the last thing on my list this year is something I would just simply call presence. I want to be more present to what's happening right now in the here and now of every day and not worry so much about living five miles down the road. Uh, just stay open to the moment, present to people who are in front of me and, and the things that surround me and not spend too much time off in worry about the future or regret about the past. One of the things I love about the gospel stories of Jesus is how he never seemed to be in a hurry and was always willing to address people who were present in front of him. I suspect he was late to everything he ever went to because how often we would read that story, somebody would come, Jesus, Master, take pity on us. Never, never too busy to stop and attend to what was in front of him. And interestingly enough, did some of his very most memorable and best works in those interruptions, to let those interruptions not be seen as trivial, but opportunities to fulfill the purposes of God. Those are some of the things on my list as covenant values that are worth renewing on this first Sunday of 2021. Maybe they're worth renewing anytime, I don't know. Uh, the world may not change because of, of those things, but I could be changed. I could be changed in my attitude and maybe you could be changed in your attitude too. And if that's so, that wonderful affirmation of Paul, given in his prison cell, that would come alive for me and maybe for you too. I'm ready for anything through him who strengthens me. Amen. Let's join together now in this historic service of covenant renewal. Brothers and sisters in Christ, the Christian life is redeemed from sin and consecrated to God. Through baptism, we have entered this life and have been admitted into the new covenant of which Christ is the mediator. He sealed it with his own blood that it might last forever. On the one side, God promises to give us new life in Christ, the source and perfecter of our faith. On the other side, we are pledged to live no more for ourselves, but only for Jesus Christ who loved us and gave himself for us. From time to time, we renew our covenant with God, especially when we reaffirm the baptismal covenant or when we gather at the Lord's table. Today, however, we meet as generations before us have met on the first Sunday of the new year to renew the covenant that binds us to God. Let us make this covenant now our own. Commit yourselves to Christ as his servants. Give yourselves to him that you may belong to him. Christ has many services to be done. Some are easy, others are difficult. Some bring honor, others bring reproach. Some are suitable to our natural inclinations and desires. Others are contrary to both. In some decisions, we may please Christ and please ourselves. In others, we cannot please Christ except by denying ourselves. It is altogether fitting then that we pause on this first Sunday of the new year and offer anew our commitment to be servants of Christ. Let us pray. I am no longer my own, but thine. Put me to what thou wilt. Rank me with whom thou wilt. Put me to doing put me to suffering. Let me be employed for thee or laid aside for thee, exalted for thee or brought low for thee. Let me be full, let me be empty. Let me have all things, let me have nothing. I freely and heartily yield all these things to thy pleasure and disposal. And now, O glorious and blessed God, thou art mine and I am thine, so be it. And may the covenant I make this day be ratified in heaven. Amen.
Friends, thank you so much for worshiping with us at Bloomington Wesley United Methodist. We hope that your heart has been warmed, that your covenant has been renewed, and that you are even more ready now to step into this new year covered by the grace of God. Just a couple of announcements before you go. Next Sunday, January 10th, is the day that the church commemorates Baptism of the Lord Sunday. We will remember together the Baptism of the Lord Jesus in the River Jordan. As a part of our worship service, we will be celebrating two baptisms, Sienna Shotland, one of our confirmation students who was unable to be confirmed and baptized this past summer, but is ready now, and Reese Nelson Samp, one of the infants who will be welcomed into our church family this year. Please come and join us for that very special celebration and bring a bowl of water as we will be renewing our own baptismal vows as well. Secondly, this coming Wednesday, January 6th, is the actual day of Epiphany, the day that the church remembers the visit of the wise men, or the Magi, to Jesus. We would invite you, join us for the Paint the Town Wesley on Wednesday the 6th at 6 o'clock p.m., and bring with you a piece of chalk. We're going to be engaging together in an old European tradition entitled Chalking the Door, in which we write a blessing and a welcome not only to the wise men, not only to the Christ child, but to the Holy Spirit of God to be a part of blessing our home and welcoming us into the new year. So a bowl of water for Sunday, a piece of chalk for Wednesday. Friends, I invite you now to receive this benediction as we prepare to go on into our day. May you go forth with your spirit renewed. May you go forth with your covenant recommitted. May you go forth with your heart ever more dedicated to living for God this day and every day. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and abide with you this day and this year and forevermore. Amen. See you next week, church.